thinking anything. I chose that thing because I think that many of the issues, many of the challenges we have to face on the planet uh, today will really require a complete reconfiguration, rethinking of everything that we think we know, we think we understand, and we think we're certain about. So what I'd like to do is actually to take you very quickly on a little journey that will take us from the uh, outer reaches of the cosmos to a Bedouin village near this area here. And in the process, I'd like to try and integrate a, a couple of things really. The, the, the abstract concept about the idea of design a definition, a new definition of sustainability, and to see how both come together in a development project uh, not far from here. So we can start with the big picture. You have here, and I'm sure many of you have seen those extraordinary images we've been getting from the Hubble Space Telescope. This one is a fantastic uh, uh, a, a, a picture known as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's the deepest we've penetrated back in time. This is an image of state of affairs about 400 million years after the Big Bang, which puts us back to about 13 point something uh, billion years ago. Uh, why that 10,000 is so significant? Because that image is a tiny bit of the whole area of the sky, which gives you a sense of the gigantic immensity of our environment. It's a dynamic thing, it's a dynamic process. So what do we see here? We have here, when we look at all this total environment, there are regions here where energy is being diffused, diffusion of energy, and regions where energies are being compounded and consolidated. And our planet Earth is certainly such a region where energy is being compounded and consolidated. Think about this as distinct from any stars that diffuses energy. And in this, solar radiation combines with matter to produce order of increasing complexity. So there are two entirely different processes here that are two sides of the same cosmic coin. There are processes in which entropy increases all the time, and there are other processes that are involved with order creation. In that respects, the design, which is the, the, the heart of producing order, of order formation, is really one of the most fundamental, the most powerfully anti-entropic function. And it can be designed as the deliberate channeling of energies which otherwise will be diffused. Which lead me to the suggestion that the really greatest design challenge that we have is this business of how to uh, bring about the worldwide transition to sustainability. This is really the biggest design challenge that we have, that you have, as, as, as people will take over and have to put some order in the messy things of fur uh, on, on the planet. So sustainability itself has been a word that is bandied around to the point that it's really lost its, uh, its meaning. I think the key thing about that notion is it pertains to a particular kind of balance in the interaction between a population and a carrying capacity of an environment, where the two sides of the equation continuously define one another. An environment defines what kind of populations are possible in the first place, and populations modify continuously the environment so that further evolution can take place. In fact, the whole history of the biosphere is a history of this kind of uh, uh, interaction. So the definition that I'm offering you is that sustainability is a dynamic, dynamic, dynamic equilibrium in the interaction. I was emphasizing dynamics, so it's not the state that you reach and stay there. A dynamic uh, equilibrium in the interaction of a population in, the, in its environment such that the population can express its full, develop to express its full potential without, without producing irreversible adverse effects on the carrying capacity of the environment on which it depends. Now, if this equilibrium is now getting out of whack, so to speak, because of the huge increase of human population and the intensification of human activity, and it manifests in all those signs of stress, what we tend to call environmental problem. This is not an environmental problem. This is a symptom of deep disease of a system out of balance. So that intensification, the used increase in human um, activities, actually has a physical uh, manifestation. You're familiar with those sunlight uh, pictures at night. This is actually, uh, if you took a picture of the planet at night uh, 100 or 200 years ago, you would not see anything like this. And this is actually a measure, a visual measure, of the intensity of activity, I mean, everything would be okay other than the fact that all these lights that you see here and that you can imagine globally are actually burning fossil fuels. This is burning up the sheep. 
you have to look at a thing like this one, which is looking at the population growth across huge dimension of time, which accentuates the geometrical growth of the population explosion. You look here, you look here for almost 10,000 years, and you see that human population on the planet rarely exceeded half a billion. What it means that, that they're rethinking everything, right? If we are hopeful to institute the planetary regime, uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability regime uh, of peace and abundance, we'll have to really forego a lot of our preconceived idea and we'll have to rethink our view of the world, our underlying values, the structure of the economy, the way the priority views of technology. Now the most sophisticated technology is going to weapons of mass destruction and others, and the very way we govern, uh, we govern things. So it's a, it's a real uh, wholesale rethinking, and the transformation that has to occur is a second order transformation, is a very fundamental deep transformation that cannot occur by just tinkering at the beats uh, slowly and, 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 and happily. Uh, it's a second order transformation where the objective is to uh, produce a well-functioning uh, 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 alignment between individuals, society, the economy, and the regenerative capacity of the life, uh, life uh, kind of uh, enhancing, life-supporting ecosystems in the biosphere. Now, in order to guide the necessary change at the sustainability laboratory, we try to develop some a, 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 a guiding framework which boils down to five fundamental five core sustainability principles. And I'll just say that those five relate to five different domains, five different domains that have to be integrated in order to create that equilibrium that we talked about before. The first domain is the material domain, which actually constitutes the necessary framework for regulating the flow of energy and matter that underlies existence. This is the physical domain, this is where you deal with chemistry, with atoms, with energy, things of that nature. The second domain is the, the economic domain, which provides the framework for defining, creating, and managing wealth. The third is the, uh, the domain of life, uh, which really provides the framework, the basis for uh, behavior in the biosphere. Uh, the social domain that provides the framework for the, the social behavior. And finally, the spiritual domain, which is the one most neglected, that really constitutes the, the uh, it kind of defines the necessary attitudinal orientation, the value system that would uh, underline or, or underwrite uh, the, the universal code of ethics. Now, I'll tell you just a very quick story. When I began to work on those principles, and I was, uh, uh, each domain has a principle, and each principle has some profound uh, operational implications. But I'll just say that when I started with this for a while, it was very easy to come very quickly to the first four domains. Uh, and for a while I felt that I had it, but I had a suspicion that something was missing. And slowly it came to my mind that what was missing is that spiritual domain. Most colleagues at the World Bank and other places I was working with would tell me, don't even use that world. If you want heads of governments and heads of companies to take you seriously, you cannot, don't think you're some kind of a crazy hippie. So I take it in and take it out, take it in and take it out, until I realized that this is what holds everything together. This is the center of gravity. This is what coheres the system as a whole. You see that everything else is but techniques. And it's the attitude, the motivation, and the purpose that determines whether we are predators or whether we are stewards. And that's why that spiritual dimension is so important, as reflected by most of you are familiar with the chief Seattle, the whole world is sacred uh, to my people. Five domains, the five principles interdepend. Very much like that circle that we saw before, they actually define each other, a holographic uh, image of it in, in the set that each one contained a relationship with all the others. And so that they have to be approached as a whole simultaneously. And in Project Valiatir, here in, in the negative, what we're trying to do is to actually demonstrate the application of those five principles in one development project. And this development project is taking place in this area near the town of Hura with the Bedouin communities, community-based enterprise. What we're trying to do there is develop a model for a sustainable agriculture in uh, arid zones, uh, which would be relevant to, the, to that community, to this area, to any any Arizona around the world. Uh, the whole idea here is to base this model on the uh, authentic tradition, 
aspiration, experience, knowledge of the Bedouins with the desert, but leverage it with advanced technology, with uh, uh, kind of cutting edge science, and with uh, advanced uh, 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 green uh, 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 technology. The area that we have, that the project takes place, some of you may recognize this, this is uh, Route 31 from Solomon Shortcut to Arad. This is the town of Pura. And we chose this, as you can see, very barren area uh, on, on, the, on the edge of a project on Wadi Atir, hence the name uh, Wadi Atir. And we chose it to be in an area where we're presenting all the different uh, types of uh, uh, Bedouin uh, the settlements. Uh, the town of Pura, which is the, the major partner with the lab on this, the, the, the mayor, Dr. Muhammad al Nabari, is my counterpart on this project. But here we have unrecognized villages, a recognized one, and we're right at the center of this with the intention of impacting that whole um, uh, environment. Uh, we, in this project, we're trying to produce fundamental innovations in all these five dimensions that they talked about. We launched it, we started it with a very long year process with uh, uh, leaders from the Bedouin community discussing what this project should be like, how it should be shaped, who will be involved, and more important than anything else, what is the fundamental value proposition that will be guided? That's the spiritual dimension, if you will. And one, uh, not only at the end of this process came, I think, the three things. A, a group of people that were devoted and became the project team. Uh, that value proposition that underlies it, what they are about, what they are committing to, uh, but that process was extended into the larger community, more than the people who uh, were involved through all, as you can see, in different parts of the desert, in order to gain a, the, the support, the confidence of the larger community that was not directly involved with the project itself. That was very important to get the confidence. As you know, the Bedouin community has been marginalized for a long time, and there's so much, uh, the, the, how do you call it, the, the, not just fear, but the, uh, suspicion of any intention from outside. It was very important to get the support of larger community uh, around. And as we started that, you'd see here some unprecedented thing where by that time the project team has emerged, uh, the, the 12 founders of that project. We tried to innovate on a number of things. One is to say that people will come from different villages, different tribes, different families, some other social innovations. But the most important is the insistence, the idea from the beginning, that women would be involved in the project team and work together with men in developing this project. And I think this was, we had the, the luck and opportunity to get some formidable young women who, whose contribution to this has been absolutely astounding. What we'll do here is develop a basically organic eco farm. Uh, one function will be in production that will grow a, a mixed herd of uh, goats and sheep. Uh, for production of organic, high-end high dairy products. This is actually very important uh, because we're trying to get back to using all the products of the herd that now are not. You know, most milk is discarded because nobody can afford to bring it to market. Wool is thrown away. We're trying to get everything back. Uh, and with the dairy product, we've already had a number of uh, uh, groups of women who undergo advanced kind of cheese making uh, courses, and they, out of those, will come the women who will operate the, the dairy. Uh, we have a very fascinating operation with medicinal plant. You know that the desert is home for hundreds of species of medicinal plant that are extremely potent but not yet known to science. Already started to experiment with producing various health-related uh, products that will be uh, yeah, kind of the, the brand of uh, the project. Uh, another project that is part of it is very interesting, run by this young lady here, uh, Mari Labrokai, is the idea of collecting all seeds of uh, vegetables, simple vegetables, either tomatoes, cucumbers, things of that nation. They're extremely nutritious, they're very powerful, they're desert hardy, they can do without other water in high salinity, but nobody uses them anymore because everybody buys fluffy, uh, non very kind of tomatoes in, in the supermarket. So this is a woman program, she already started working with uh, groups of women to train them how to create gardens and treat the seeds and raise the vegetable. And these women will be trainers who will start working with women in houses to reintroduce uh, vegetables into homes. Uh, at the heart of this will be a visitor kind of ecotourism center, uh, training and education center. That center will, will serve the outlying villages in terms of uh, uh, advanced training in better technologies, how to raise sheep and, and, and so on. And it's becoming a major school. I mean, all the high schools from the south, from the negative, uh, all the high schools, 
not just Bedouin schools, will come to this site uh, regularly in order to do their uh, ecology and environmental uh, education. This is Shahde uh, Abu Sbeif, who runs the education and developing now the education uh, uh, program of, of, of this thing. We have this incredible uh, design team that involves people from the project team, from the community, as well as, again, some of the researchers from BGU and some other technical consultants. And with this group, we work together to create a very fascinating integrated technology infrastructure that will support this operation, integrated in, so we're trying to eliminate emissions as far as possible, and to really make sure that all waste is treated as a resource. So every function is connected to any other function as a, as, as, as a way of, uh, of, of fitting things, and the center of the solar energy and so forth. We have some biogas uh, at the center of this, uh, 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 reconstructed wetlands for water, the whole system for water, solar energy. This is basically the picture of the site. Most of the, you, you see all the farm areas in the, in the north end, the dark fields are the medicinal plants, the, the uh, 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 brighter are, are basically uh, grazing fields where we grow organic fodder for the uh, animals. We have this uh, large uh, olive grove in the middle and you've seen all the trees, they're about the thing. This is a, an impression of the site, how it will be three years from now when you come uh, uh, to visit. I think because of this uh, comprehensive approach to that thing, the project had a huge impact and we have visitors almost every month from every part of the world. The World Economic Forum from Switzerland, the Birthright USA who spent that days working with us. Uh, last year we had the president of the country, Shimon Peres, uh, visited the project. And uh, so it goes. Uh, in November, we actually started work on the site. Karen Kayenet is doing all of the site preparation for us. And you can see the big bulldozer of this work is just about finished. And the piece of desert that you saw before is really looking completely different now. Uh, a month ago, in, in, uh, actually in March, the, how all the high school kids from Pura came to the site to plant the, the olive tree growth. It's about 360 trees, very high quality trees that we use for the thing. So this is the project of Project Valiatir. This is the group of founders behind it, the people who are running this. Uh, and if there's one thing to learn from the project, when we started this, almost anyone said, this is totally impossible, this will never work, you'll never get anything done. Uh, I was turned down so many times by all the experts and all the people that I was seeking help. Uh, if there's something to learn from this, is everything that many of the talks today demonstrated. Never tell anyone, ne ne never have anyone tell you what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, we, we really need to deal with the impossible. This is, what, this is the challenge of that design thing that I started with. We need to rethink everything. Uh, we need to throw away all the old sacred cars of yesterday and join forces collaboratively across the world to produce a future of abundance, peace, and sustainability. Thank you very much.